It's a delight to be here and see so many interested people. This is uh, an important issue, uh, particularly for those of us that are well acquainted with the fishing business and also with uh, roots in the environmental community. So I'm delighted to be here to talk about climate change with regard to fisheries. First though, I'd like to review some basic characteristics of the Gulf of Maine. That's where we are and uh, it's a wonderful place to work and explore uh, and it is changing so it's a little sobering. But to get off to a good start, let's talk about uh, what those of you that were with Jeff Runge's uh, uh, presentation a few minutes ago will be bored. If it gets really tiresome, yawn. I'll pick it up and we'll skip it. But basically, <clears throat> cold water from the Labrador current, which is that greenish colored arrow that goes into Bay of Fundy uh, is from the Labrador current. It's cold and it uh, has always been quite, uh, quite salty as well. Once inside, it goes up to the head of Bay of Fundy and then hooks to the southwest as it comes out and meets with that inner gyre of the main coastal current to form this larger Gulf of Maine gyre, which goes all the way down to Cape Cod and swings out to the north side of George's Bank. Tidal fluctuations in shallow water on top of George's Bank creates uh, a secondary clockwise gyre uh, that uh, gives you the most peculiar tides that you'd ever imagine uh, out there. Water leaves uh, the Gulf of Maine via the Great South Channel in the west by Cape Cod, but also a percentage of it goes out in the east side as well. We've got four major factors that uh, are affecting this process. One of them is uh, Gulf of Maine is warming very fast. Sea level is rising twice as fast as it was in the last century in the Gulf of Maine. Meltwater from the Arctic is lowering the Gulf of Maine salinity the hard way. And carbon dioxide is projected to make the Gulf of Maine more acidic. Uh, that's a reality check. Let's take a look at uh, major factors we have to deal with. Um, let's look at temperature first. Uh, global temperatures are expected to be increasing more than what they currently are. It's caused by melting ice. That's almost a no-brainer. The melting ice dilutes seawater, lowers the salinity. This makes the seawater less dense. And in turn, it causes the Labrador current, which is flowing uh, down along the ocean, uh, edge of the ocean shelf, uh, to flow slower. And because it's now flowing slower, smaller amounts of it end up getting into the Gulf of Maine, smaller amounts of cold seawater coming in. This allows the water that's already there to remain longer and get warmer. So the Gulf of Maine ends up warming up about eight times faster than most other areas on the planet. Not a particularly nice situation for us to be in. Now, about sea level rise in the Gulf of Maine. As you can see from this 100-year graph, it's been going on for centuries. This is only the last part of it. And it seems to have started going, increasing significantly in the 1880s. Uh, 
air temperature increases, uh, e.g. CO2 is responsible for that probably as well, but since we weren't there to take samples, we can't make too many observations like that. But uh, the sea level rise is, is the consequence of melting ice, which obviously increases the volume, increases the volume of water in the ocean overall. That's happening everywhere. But also, when you have thousands of square miles of water warming, water expands. And even though it's a small amount in your glass of water, it's very significant when it comes to the entire ocean. I like to use Bar Harbor as an example of sea level rise because it really hasn't happened to us there. Uh, tidal height in Bar Harbor today, however, is increasing three times faster than it was just a few years ago. They expect tides uh, to increase as much as uh, it did in the next 16 years, to increase as much as it did in the previous 52 years put together. So brace yourself for another six inches of tidal rise uh, in the not terribly distant future. Here's another example closer to turf for me. This is my hometown. This is Sands Cove as you come into Carver's Harbor of Vinyl Haven. And it looks very much like uh, these fish houses are uh, confronted with a, uh, a little bit of global warming already, which surprises me. Lowest salinity is another issue. But it's pretty obvious. If you've got all of this ice melting, uh, you definitely are going to have it diluting uh, the salt water. And the, that area between uh, south of Greenland, actually, that Jeff Brunch was talking about, the settling area for salty, very dense water, uh, is where it, the effect is becoming most significant because the water that's now settling, being less dense, is moving slower. Well, that's reality check <clears throat> 101. Here's pH, which again Jeff Runge pointed out, showing the relationship between atmospheric CO2, seawater, uh, 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 carbon dioxide that's dissolved in seawater, and the changes that are occurring in the pH, the increases in salinity, if you will, in blue. There isn't any question or illusion or uh, insignificance about this. It's happening. And uh, there isn't any, certainly isn't any easy solution. But we are aware that this process is continuing, and this stopped at the year 2015, so we've got another four years on top of it. Okay, well, those are the four uh, general significant uh, factors that have concerned me as a over-the-hill old curmudgeon fisherman and, uh, and researcher. Uh, let's talk about uh, the fishing industry and how these effects uh, are going to, how these factors are going to affect uh, these important are species for dear old state of Maine. First of all, though, let's look at the characteristics of how these fish populations work. Phytoplankton eat nutrients, and in the presence of light, they are the sole source of 
conversion of energy, light energy into useful food. It's eaten by zooplankton, which Greg Grunge was talking about, uh, which in turn is eaten by herring alewives and other critters like that, to finally, which in turn are finally eaten by everything else. Uh, if you wanted to sequester more carbon to try to reverse this process, I'd say, why not cut back on the capture of uh, herring, alewives, and other planktivores so you've got an enormous biomass that can feed another enormous biomass of their predators. Uh, trillions of pounds of carbon would be stored for not only incredible periods of time, but if we harvest it at this very high sustainable level, what an immense amount of food we would have added to our plate. That's probably sounds a little biased seems I fish for most of those species up there for a good many years. But in fact, to me it sounds like a very one very practical approach to the problem. Another key component of this is our co coastal estuaries. This is the well sanctuary down to the south. Uh, it's a very productive one. But if you look closely, you'll find that virtually all of the production, all of the nursery areas in the Gulf of Maine are along a, about a 10 mile, 15 mile fringe along the coast and in the shore areas of the offshore banks. Pretty sober. Reality check too. Uh, these are nursery habitats for a whole suite of uh, valuable species. But uh, problems with acidification are really significant. And that brings us to Maine's shellfish industries, mussels, clams, scallops, and a robust aquaculture industry for oysters. Not because the adult uh, shellfish can't tolerate variations in pH. Actually, they handle it quite well. The larvae do not. Uh, unfortunately, uh, lower pH interferes with the ability of that larvae to incorporate calcium carbonate to form a shell. And with no shell, the larvae die. Period. Increasing levels of CO2 in the water before this process begins, therefore, is a very clear threat to our wild clam, mussel, and scallop fisheries as well as the aquaculture industry. Okay, well, now for the real hurdle. The illustrious American lobster. Uh, lobsters are pretty tough. They'll tolerate water temperatures up to about 18 degrees centigrade. That's about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. They do pretty well, so they've got a lot of mileage. Uh, Lava lobsters can do a little better. They can, they can uh, prosper up to about 20 degrees centigrade before mortality skyrockets. Well, that's 68 degrees. That's pretty comfortable. I wouldn't mind going swimming in water that long. Uh, there's a. Uh, there's catches, though. Uh, one of them is that shell disease increases significantly with warming water. And there's been a wild card that surfaced in the study for the great collapse of lobsters in Long Island Sound, 
It seems when Lops's immune systems are weakened by long stretches of above average temperature, a newly discovered parasite, paraamoebiasis, literal, a, uh, a marine amoeba, invades and engulfs nervous tissue inside the lobster, uh, nervous tissue of the lobster and causes death. Scientists uh, examining uh, what samples they had of lobsters in Long Island Sound found that 92% of the lobsters carried the parasite during the die-off. Yikes. So there are pitfalls to dealing with warmer water. pH, though, is not as hazardous for uh, a crustacean, uh, lobsters in particular, as it is for uh, the regular shellfish. And the reason for that is, is they have a layer of chitinous tissue on the outside of their shell, which appears to shield them from modest changes in pH. Studies to date appear to show very little effect on larval or adult lobsters. So that is not an ongoing danger, though research continues. We don't know yet. Um, there are still concerns. Lobsters are plentiful, but for decades, we fishermen anyway have known that the center of the population has been moving farther north and east for years. Back in the mid-60s, Connecticut, the Connecticut shore fishermen were catching more losses per trap than we were in dear old Vinyl Haven, Maine. And that moved progressively up the coast. So there's, uh, there's considerable concern that uh, these lobs are just going to keep moving farther east, and first thing we know, they'll be out of Gulf of Maine and U.S. waters. Well, that would be tragic, because that is our last major fishery in the state of Maine. Well, I have a series of slides that play pretty fast that shows how these po the lobster population has changed from the 1960s up through 2014, and I'll see if I can make it work. Whoops. Here we go. The date's on the side. 67, you can see where the lobsters weren't. But by 2014, you can certainly see where they are now. That's uh, that's sobering in one way. I can't stop that. So I'll switch to the next slide before everyone goes to sleep. I have to comment on it, though. When you looked at that, it's clear that lobsters have expanded their range. The area around the state of Maine uh, literally the main coast, and now going down the Canadian coast, there's more, there's more lobsters than uh, my grandfather ever dreamed of. Uh, and I want to show you real quick, again, because I don't see where lobsters have moved very far from the range they were in in the 60s. I'm saying what happened might have something to do with putting escape vents in your traps, protecting brood stock, and all of that stuff. Oh, come to find out. 
I'm running out of time, and it's Robin's turn. My watch is slow. Let's move on. We've examined lobsters. Let's see what else we have. Uh, it could be that we've been doing things at smaller spatial scales than what we're seeing with global temperature. In fact, it may be what fishermen have been doing for some time. Cod are less fortunate, though. They collapsed back in the mid-90s. And here's a slideshow that will show you how they changed. Again, whoops, let me go back up. Here's where it started. As time went on, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 99, 2000 to 2003. The thesis is, is that global warming has wiped out the codfish and that they have moved all to the east and the north. It looks to me like they moved to Massachusetts Bay, and that's in the west, which again suggests that maybe the influence of this temperature change, certainly at this point, isn't more due to small-scale things being done, like protecting spawning areas, protecting nursery grounds, protecting the prey base for these fish. Uh, that's avoiding the calamity that uh, uh, that global warming promises to eventually give to us all. That's it. My padding shot is this vulnerability index. And the circles show which of our four species are most threatened. Blue mussels are most threatened. Atlantic sea scallops are equally. Atlantic cod and Atlantic lobster are moderately challenged, which means that we can still do an awful lot, and we may very well simply have created a chicken coop for lobsters instead of uh, in danger of losing them. Uh, thank you. And now my better half has some really important stuff.